So um, my name is Tatiana Melma. I am the acting and curator of academic programs here at the Falcon. And um, I want to start by gratefully acknowledging that we are gathered here today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Muskegon people. And in thinking critically and about myself and situating myself in this place, I want to think about today's program and all the programming that we do as sort of part of this constellation of relationships and this ongoing relationship and responsibility to think critically about the stories that we tell about ourselves in both art and science. And why are we gathered here today? So this uh, exhibition, as well as this talk, is part, it's happening in conjunction with the exhibition Drift, as well as a uh, residency that's been happening. Um, and it's part of a collaboration between the Stuart Lawson Quantum Matter Institute and the Department of Physics and Astronomy um, at UBC. And so this, this project has been called Arts of Arciencia. So it's an interdisciplinary research project, and it's about fusing practices between art and science. So beginning in May of this year, um, scientists were partnered with a six-month residency with artists, and they were going to explore and identify areas of collaborative research. So the artists involved are Justine Chambers, Joseph Lee, Conley, who's here with us today, and Kelly Lycan. And so they've been working with uh, the physicists Risa Greenwood, Greenwood Alana Hollis, uh, Daniel Porch, Porch, sorry, Porchinski, Porchinski, um, Kurt Madison, Sarah Morris, and Luke Reynolds. So they've been they're going to be reflecting on the findings of this collaborative research together in a symposium in November. And so as part of leading up to that symposium, we'll be having a series of artist talks, and, uh, and each of the artists are going to reflect on their practice and why they're initially um, interested in getting involved in this collaborative, collaborative process. And so I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Khan today, who will be kicking off the series. And Khan Lee uh, studied architecture at Hong Kong um, University before and immigrated to Canada to study fine art at Ellen Park. And he works in performance, media, sculpture, and drawing. And his practice involves experimentation with form and process in order to express inherent relationships between material and immaterial content. So he's a founding member of Vancouver-based collective Intermission, and he's also uh, presently a member of Instant Coffee, which uh, many of us are familiar with as artist collective as well. And his work has also been uh, exhibited nationally and internationally. So please uh, join me in welcoming Khan today. Hello everyone. So I actually just thought that there's only going to be like five people here. Uh, and I thought that everyone who comes would kind of um, know my work a little bit um, from the previous experience. So I kind of prepared this to be kind of like only brought a few images and I kind of prepared this as this new thing that I'm sort of uh, new ideas that I'm thinking about and trying to connect with my own practice. Um, it's a theory. Um, I, I have more questions than uh, answers of um, whatever this is, but um, we're going to keep it really brief and um, I'm just going to relax and chat a little bit and so we, um, so um, like, uh, like Tatiana has mentioned, I'm, within my practice, I'm trying to um, think about um, what is visible and what is invisible within the structure of the work itself, and trying to think about the meanings of the invisible part. Or sometimes I take something that um, I feel that I witness a little bit more than how other um, general audience or general populace are experiencing, and trying to empathize something to trying to um, bring out the essence of the experience. Uh, from my own perspective, in a hope that um, that will maybe um, give a chance to uh, enhance or give a different idea, so a different perspective of um, looking at the same object or same events or things that's happening around. Um, I'm just gonna start with this image here. Um, the one on the one on the left might be considered one of kind of one of my uh, earliest work called uh, Act Number 13, which is a bunch of plates that I've been collecting through, uh, mainly through thrift stores. 
Um, and I had this idea of uh, stacking these plates in a certain way to, um, to um, create a certain kind of homo poly. Um, in this case, um, um, I was attempting to make a shape, uh, shape of the egg or the, um, the loop, you know, shape of any bottom and a pointy top. Um, one on the uh, right hand side is just an image of uh, an old school in upstate New York, which is now converted into an art, um, art gallery. Um, with its uh, school feature, uh, mainly under um, repair and maintenance uh, situation. When, you, when I take a look at these two images, they look very different, but I also found that they have um, a lot of similarities. Um, within its concept and within its uh, structure. Um, the main difference is that um, in my sculpture, um, all these things, although, although I was trying to uh, make a work of this idea of invisibleness, um, there are also invisible, a lot of invisible parts of the sculpture that you don't really get to see. And, um, it's because that the um, although the idea was trying to make a shape out of this bunch of a stacked plate, the stacking itself is just not enough to give it the quality that I wanted to give the work. So there are shims and there are different layers of a filler material and a lot of other um, other um, substructure to emphasize the work. Um, to emphasize the shape that work is meant to represent. Um, and um, on the uh, repairing and maintenance side on the school building, um, because of the uh, structures uh, or this construction is driven by the time schedule, um, there is an assumption that the, um, the work, in this case, this little bell tower, is not meant to be shown to the public. Therefore, all the support structure can um, surround the work, although it's quite visible, um, to be able to perform these um, main maintenance and services. Um, so you might get a sense right now. So this idea is like, so I've been thinking about this idea of a support structure that in order for um, production to happen, there are a lot of other things that has to happen simultaneously, um, but they may not be part of the presentation itself. Um, another way to think about it is that um, that the um, um, the production um, not only um, needs all the support structure in uh, in a form of um, literally supports like scaffoldings or instruments or different um, readings or different um, <clears throat> artifacts. It also um, creates a lot of um, um, things that is not really part of the work. Um, I call it byproduct. Um, that um, I see the connection between what is presented and um, what is not presented within the same package and um, it's really hard to distinguish those kind of things. So though my um, next series of work, I'm trying to use this um, idea of the support and support structure um, as the base of the work, um, instead of um, showing the, uh, the positive side or the um, truth or whatever you want to call it. Um, this is currently my favorite scaffolding in Vancouver right now because um, um, often um, to build this kind of structure, um, people think about patternings and uh, repetition and different things. Um, and in certain cases, whoever was putting these things together does not really think about it in this um, idea of um, repeating that. Um, the work or the structure kind of have um, this uh, form of unpredictableness, which I kind of relate to um, the form of artwork in a different way. Um, 
This is a little um, scaffolding work that I'm trying to um, trying to uh, produce. Um, I had a high ambition to be a um, greater structure, um, but so far, um, so far. Um, however, I got to um, until today. So um, I'm also um, I'm really interested in the idea of scaffolding. Um, um, one that is repeatable, and second, it is very structural. Um, and I found certain amounts of beauty in uh, repetition and different things that kind of repeating itself. And also, uh, this one is a scale down to about one to fifty. Uh, with um, um, with the smaller scale, instead of the actual one to scale work within the gallery space. I feel that I managed to bring a lot of feeling down to um, to um, potentially a, um, have a larger gesture within the small gallery space in that. Um, this scaffolding that I found in Alert Bay um, this summer of uh, repairing um, repairing uh, old totem pole. Um, as you can see, this kind of idea of a support is um, inherent and it is always um, necessary and oftentimes when um, things are in um, desperate need of maintenance it kind of becomes part of the structure in a semi, semi permanent level I think this scaffolding has been um, around this particular uh, totem pole for more than years and now so um, from the viewer's point of view um, it is really like really um, hard to distinguish um, between what you're looking at as an artwork and also everything that's surrounding us at the same time. Um, um, this is all, but also one of my only work called Adaptation, um, which was inspired by um, looking at, looking behind uh, anyone's office desk in the same kind of, same kind of way. Again, with the same idea that um, since this um, idea of a modern life um, requires so many electronic devices and its power, um, that um, things have to be plugged in and there has to be some kind of adapters and adaptations that's inherent to, to our daily living at the same time. But behind the desk is often where you're looking at and find beauty in it. And I thought, I thought by taking a simple gesture, I could enhance that experience into something more like obvious um, mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, and have um, composition and form within the, within the context itself. Um, this one is, um, is an installation that I did in collaboration with um, one of my favorite Clark collaborator, um, um, Andrew Lee. He's also a sound artist, and I had a chance to um, I had a chance to visit this empty vault of um, his commercial laundry uh, laundry facility in Vancouver. Uh, and upon my visit. Um, um, this is a room where people used to um, store really expensive fur coats and different fur items um, that is uh, protected from moss and all these other elements and really expensive items to store at home and such. Um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, the, um, the popularity of the fur item has been declining since 1980s. Um, this room's been um, set empty since 1982 or something until I did this installation in 2014. Um, I found the room and all I have done was to uh, install this uh, tiny little um, colored light on a motion sensor. Um, that's um, timed for about 5 to 10 seconds of time. So um, when there's no audience within the space, um, the room is pitch dark as there's no windows or no access or no other ways of looking into the room. Um, but as people move in, um, the room kind of takes the shape of the movement, turn these lights on and off, and um, lights in primary colors constantly mixing the lights 
to create an interesting pattern just with the interaction of the audience themselves, which I thought was really interesting. Um, also, um, with collaboration with Andrew Lee, we were able to um, make a musical composition based on the bass note of the laundry machine that's within the space. Um, so we sort of um, scored our original soundtrack. Uh, I think it was in the key of a B minor or something. It happened to be the uh, um, cycle of the revolution of these machines that was running in the space there. Um, this one is called uh, 108 Steps which is a um, prominent artwork that's on Kingsway. Um, then, um, again, um, in the shape of ladder. Um, and I thought the ladder is very interesting things. Um, so, because it's a utility um, that is used in order to gain access to higher ground and also access to a lot of different things um, that's been used um, a lot in gallery installations and constructions and a lot of other um, other situations like that but it is never a shape that's celebrated um, um, because of its uh, its own quality of um, you, um, it being a support item that often on opening night we, uh, we probably use these things until the very last minute but just before light turns off you tuck it away in the behind as, as if the things are just a magic that just happened right in front of your eyes. And same as in a lot of architecture and in building constructions, all these, um, all these um, elements and debris and idea in order to build this structure is often tucked away um, and not really being part of the presentation. So I thought it was kind of like um, interesting to make a sculpture in the form of a ladder just to celebrate um, everyone and everything that's behind the scene to be able to produce something um, um, and this is sort of like an aerial shot of where this ladder is located um, the work is called 108 steps um, i am not a buddhist myself um, but i grew up in buddhist culture when i was living in south korea and the number 108 kind of uh, signifies um, everything that every task you have to fulfill in order for you to uh, graduate into the next level. So you can um, we can come back to the world in different things. So until you accomplish all these hundred different 108 different tasks, um, your life your life kind of repeat, repeats itself um, and not being able to take it to the next level. Um, this, one, um, this one is called Shunt. It's uh, originally a um, seven channel video of, um, of a train um, out in uh, interior BC near Kamloops. Um, the sound of shunting was, I was always fascinated with the sound, uh, sound of shunting, um, which is caused by the chain reaction when the train cars are backing up and taking up the little gap between the trucks to make these great sounds. Um, but I realized that although, um, although um, I really love to hear this sound, I have never witnessed the action that's happening because the action was always um, second thought that uh, when you're expressing this sound you're gonna hear the sound first and then you turn around but by the time you turn around it is kind of really late to catch the action so I realized that the only way for me to actually catch the action is um, set up a bunch of camera trying to line them up perfectly um, and wait somewhere until this train comes in um, to um, take that action um, uh, and I was fortunate enough to um, um, gain an access to the shunting yard or they call it train yard just outside of the Kamloops um, with the permission of the local indigenous population that we were, um, we were we had this camera set up for about two days of time to try to capture this action um, 
it was interesting. Um, um, I can probably say it was maybe about 75% successful. Um, but the, the experience of um, waiting around and looking at this um, workplace at where um, I'm not normally familiar about what the scope of work is like during the day kind of give me a lot of ideas and I feel like I've learned a lot about um, this idea of this movements and then train. I thought it was also a very um, iconic Canadian um, item that um, trans, um, trans, uh, transport goods that we need every day to different places in this massive country. Um, there's an installation shot of the um, work at the Kamloops Art Gallery. Um, some of some of these videos are available um, through a link through my website. So if you guys are interested in taking a look at some of the videos, um, um, please um, check out my website. Um, unfortunately, um, with this particular work, because it was a seven channel of a high definition video, that's a Press down to one single screen. The experience you you had you're gonna get may not be as great as the actual installation in the gallery space. Um, um, this one is called the uh, each uh, each Chushimu, uh, which is made from uh, this little residency um, that I was participating in uh, in a little town in south of Japan called Minago City. Um, Upon my arrival, um, I noticed these yellow flowers everywhere in this town. Um, and then soon later, I saw also noticed these yellow flowers not only in, the, not only in this small town, but pretty much everywhere that I went to within the Japanese landscape. Um, upon a little bit of researches, um, I found out these flowers called uh, Canadian Golden Ra was um, introduced to Japan in early uh, 19th century as a cut flower, but somehow the uh, Japanese environment was perfect match for this plant that um, by now it kind of became a number one invasive species in Japan. Um, and as a Canadian artist visiting Japan um, and noticing this thing, the, I thought the right gesture was trying to um, um, cut them down as much as possible as a symbolic gesture. Um, so um, I got a permission to um, um, use this farm hill that was fully covered in this yellow flower um, to cut this little form um, in Chinese characters um, called um, Ich Joshimu in Japan, it's called Ilchang Chungmong in Korean. Um, I do not know how it's pronounced in Chinese culture, um, but it's basically saying one great field of spring dream, kind of saying uh, nothing lasts forever, um, that you're, you're not here to stay and everything is temporal and has a temporal nature. Um, later I found out in Chinese culture it may have a little bit more negative um, negative uh, feeling than however it was uh, perceived in Korean culture um, as a poetic gesture, which I thought was also kind of interesting. Um, lots of few things are, these are also um, some of the uh, watercolors that I made of um, cell phone towers um, um, with the title of a Wings of Desire. Um, Cell phone tower is also a really interesting thing and really important support um, structure within this contemporary society as everyone is, um, everyone is relying on mobile devices and Wi-Fi internet um, for our daily communication. But um, at the same time, a lot of people actually don't really see these towers existing everywhere, mainly because um, we only want to, um, we only see what we believe is true. So by, um, by um, so often I found that people eliminate this idea of antennas or this um, 
visible obstructions from the mind, um, thinking that everything ha happens just like magic, just like without any structure. So this one is in Twasen, you see, um, and these little circles are in Harbor Center um, in Vancouver, BC. Um, next one is called uh, setting uh, brown, brown, um, black and white. This one is also an installation that I was collaborating with Andrew Lee, um, with this simple idea of um, realizing there are so many things you can have it for free using uh, online services, uh, especially through Craigslist. And one, one day I sat down, I found about uh, three dozen free organs within the free section of the Craigslist. And I thought, I thought it would be really interesting to make a project uh, using some of these items that, um, that used to have great value to their family and to their education and um, different environment, but now no longer have any value attached to it at all. Um, and um, I thought it would be kind of uh, kind of interesting to um, think about the uh, similarities between this object and create an environment where you can sit one top on top of one organ while you can play the one that, uh, right on top uh, right next to it. Um, which naturally create this um, form of ascending pattern, and that's kind of what we're going for. Um, so next one, you can kind of see people uh, interacting with the uh, organs in this makeshift platform. Um, during the day of the exhibition, we would place a certain element. I, I, if you can kind of see this little uh, mocha pot, there's a little banana up there, and the, I think there's a little flask and whiskey doll somewhere. Um, to hold the notes down, to play certain kind of notes, and as, as the audience are interacting with the installation and coming into the space, they would um, move those items and place in different things. Um, so within the day, uh, it naturally creates sort of like endless um, composition that's ever so changing. Um, this one is um, a little uh, temporary outdoor sculpture that I call Blue. Uh, it's made out of a sealed um, dress shirt, um, which I got it for free from a thrift store, um, that's sewn together to hold air to make this shape. Um, it's not the... Um, um, when I was making the work, I was kind of more interested in the, um, the form these shirts are creating, but with this um, mind of mindset of thinking about the support and its support structure, I thought it was kind of interesting because um, it's impossible to suspend these sculptures in outdoor situation. Therefore, I had to build a certain kind of structure for it to be able to be presented in a certain way. And without the support structure, um, which is quite visible, but yet invisible, um, you wouldn't have the same representation. Um, this one is called um, Composition for Seven Pianos, uh, which happened about two years after um, I, was, I was making the uh, installation with the organs with Andrew Lee, um, that now I have done the organs before, I thought I have to challenge myself and move on to the pianos. So, um, and luckily there are also so many pianos for free that you can have online. So, and we have a little bit of funding to be able to um, find some helpers to move these pianos with me. So, um, so I found these seven pianos for free, um, again, through the free uh, section of the tracks list and uh, simply um, made a form of a circle with these pianos on Rotten Square. Um, it was installed for about two weeks of time. Um, and at the end of the... Um, um, the piano itself was very interesting um, because, um, because nobody would be uh, willing to tune these pianos for me that's sitting outside. So I kind of had to learn how to tune the pianos myself. My job was not the best, but it kind of did the trick. But um, as I had to spend a lot of time with these pianos, 
um, especially around the lunchtime in downtown. Um, it was also the interaction between um, the passerbys and the audiences. With the piano piece, that was kind of really intriguing to me in a different way. Often there, um, there were a group of, ch uh, group of children playing these pianos around for a while, and there's some um, office, um, office types of persons sitting on a piano uh, on lunch time for 10, 15 minutes and playing this beautiful music. And also, um, I, um, I worked with a composer to make a special composition for seven pianos. Um, and I did choose seven different players in very different um, skill level. Some of them are quite senior or self-taught uh, piano player. Some of the, pe um, some of, some of the uh, people that I invited uh, used to play piano when they were a child, but then uh, with their profession and things, they kind of lost, either lost interest or kind of lost uh, their touch with the instrument. And I was able to convince them to come back and do this performance with me. And we had one um, seven-year-old, seven-year-old autistic kid um, who um, who the piano, who believed the piano was literally um, instrumental to holding his mind and himself together. Um, and also the, having this diversity between different players kind of made it kind of more interesting as an art project. Um, there's an image of um, people playing pianos together and a performance day. Um, and um, I thought this was going to be a really intimate moment, so I prepared a little special video of something that i kind of been working on this summer, which is not really complete yet, and it's just an idea or um, that I'd like to share, and um, that will be the end of my talk. So, let's see what we did first. So, I had an opportunity to attend this program this summer um, related to my practice and my work and my focus was um, trying to think about the way of producing things that I'm not too familiar with and I just wanted this time to be a challenging time to make me uh, to think about how I do things and why I do things as well. So I kind of started with uh, making a list of every way that I don't really make artwork. Um, and some of the findings that I have through that experience was um, things like um, storytelling, uh, being messy, and also working with the environment, and a few other things. Um, that um, initially I've been collecting these earbuds that nobody is wanted or discarded or broken. Um, through the last three or four years of time. And I'm, I had a quite a bit of a collection. Um, maybe I think I had about uh, 50 of them that I was trying to make a sculpture out of all these earbuds. Um, but that attempt failed terribly. Um, um, and um, due to a bunch of different limitations. Um, and then, then I realized that the earbuds are um, made to play sounds. Um, they can also be used as a microphone and also um, also um, they have personality and different colors and different structures and different elements that are kind of looking at it. Um, and then I, I thought about this idea of feedback, which is kind of like support for support because it's like it happens um, due to the uh, support to each other between two very different kind of elements and systems. Um, and I wanted to try to um, use the feedback as part of the sculpture. Um, so I created this little device that is basically a small mixer, a couple microphones, uh, picking up the sounds from the um, the uh, coming out from tiny sound that's coming out of these earbuds 
um, with the addition of a fan, oscillating fan, moving these um, pieces around to try to create um, 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 create an environment that's kind of like changing. And at the same time, um, I use the elements that's already given into the space as a part of the installation to create certain kind of new. Um, like I said, this is just a prototype and just for today. Um, <laughs> and uh, the video is about five minutes long and then here we go. Thank you. Thanks so much, Han. Um, I just wanted to open it up for questions and have a bit of a conversation. Does anyone have any questions for Han, I noticed you skipped over a couple, like the, the 
stove of the TV, and uh, also the one with those barbecue tanks. Yeah, I, I'd love to hear about them, but also a question about one that you did do is you know the hundred and eight steps, mm -hmm. which I've seen many times. Uh, I really like it. I mean, it, but for me, it's like climbing. It's like aspiration. But my question is: Is it tapered towards the top? Or is it just like a ladder where each rung is the same width? Because from at least the distant picture, it looks like it's, it gives you the illusion if you're standing under it that it's even taller than it is. Yeah, so it is, yeah, it is tapered just a little bit, just enough to uh, make you feel that it's a bit taller than that. Yeah, it's an amazing effect. It's dangerous though, because when I'm driving by it, I'm always looking up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of the interesting thing about the shape of ladder is that it's really hard not to look at the very top one of the whole structure. It kind of like always wants to place yourself at the highest highest point of the thing. Um, so yeah, and then, and then just to recap, like. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the the other two? Yeah, so you'll find the images from my website. Um, the TV looking thing is called uh, U-Lock. Um, it's based, um, it's inspired from the uh, CDS TV program called U-Lock, which is their uh, broadcasting system to broadcast burning fire in a fireplace as their uh, holiday gift. I think it started in 1968, and I thought it was kind of interesting because 1968 is also the year that uh, Sony kind of became really popular in North America by making the uh, Trimtron TV, and that's the year that we kind of this idea of uh, Japanese-made TV and Japanese-made electronics becomes something something that is to look for in the thing. Um, but anyway, so I made um, I made um, cast iron version of the TV um, based on the same vintage of TVs in the area, so I can actually uh, use it as a working fireplace uh, and a working sculpture. Um, unfortunately, at the gallery exhibition, I was not allowed to build the fire in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the um, the um, propane tanks. Um, are also quite interesting. I like them because um, they only last 10 years. Um, that um, every 10 years we have to get recertified, but the uh, cost of recertification is exactly the same as buying a brand new tank. So, um, so a lot of people don't really think that um, it makes a viable sense um, to be used as a, as a, a vessel that will hold the propane gas inside. But at the same time, as a sculptor, um, these materials are always very interesting to me because if you don't really think about using it as what it's meant to be used, um, there are a lot of other things you do kind of safely. Um, that um, in my case, um, I sort of made uh, made a sculpture, um, vertical sculpture that kind of kind of resembles the idea of endless column. I called it column. Um, but at the same time have a very different feeling and using a very different material and that is commonly um, visually recognizable and available. Mm -hmm. That's a good question when you asked a long time ago. Can you tell us more about the the attendance and why you call the wings of desire so the, the, the connection to the movie? Yeah, so the wings of desire, the title of the show Wings of Desire came from um, a movie by Ray Mendes called Wings of Desire. It's about these angels in um, old Berlin who got so stressed out because people were using so many different um, broadcasting and radio frequencies that the um, on the on the premises that the angels cannot not share all the frequencies of uh, communications in the air. That, that becomes their um, part of frustration. And I thought, um, I thought within the same premises, in a modern world, all 
engineers will be insane trying to hear all these like millions of telephone communications and all these website browsings and text messages on top of all the other things. Um, so anytime I look at this entire hours, um, I not only uh, think about the communication itself, but just the sheer amount of data that's getting through um, these devices without us recognizing or visually um, accepting at all. So. so it's a bit different than the way I would interpret it when I saw it. <laughs> Both the movie and your, and your special picture. <laughs> In the movie, I didn't get that sense that they're listening to communications through mm. radio frequency, but they could just hear the human thoughts. Yeah. And that's because they're angels, so they're sort of your guardian angel, so they hear your feelings. Mm. And that, of course, gets them very concerned. Yeah. So, so now, my, my, when I was looking at it, I thought this is equivalent to the angel, a modern version of the angels, which are there. They're sort of the mediums that you, know, you use in your deliver your thoughts, communicate your thoughts, yeah. and the angels will connect them to human beings. Right. So yeah. I had that is, I think it would be more positive than that, right? That yeah. these angels really they were suffering, but they were servicing and playing an important role in yeah. including people in communication. Yeah. As those powers, not knowing it. Yeah. Do and right. it's actually quite remarkable yeah. at the beginning of the movie, right? Where the two angels are stuck and yeah. only the kids see them. So where is the kid? The kids could see the angels, but uh, if the adults could not. Is there an equivalent that I did? Or? Um, I didn't really think that deeply about it uh, on that book. But um, um, at the same time, I, I thought it was kind of um, interesting part of Part for me from the movie is that um, is that humanness that they desire, uh, not the angelness that they desire, kind of to the world from there. I don't know if that is the solution to Yeah, I, I, I heard that you were afraid that the explanation in terms of. Uh, yeah, it's a slightly different way that I interpret the movie. Gotcha. One day we should watch it again. In the last piece you showed, you talked about first grading a list of all the ways in which you tend not to do your art. But how do you think that will impact any future art you do from now on? And if you were to talk to someone who wasn't an artist, how would you suggest that that sort of activity might influence their practice? Um, well, I mean, like, I discovered that sometimes um, it's just really interesting to take different approaches. Um, I also discovered that some things I just cannot change the way that I do things, um, that I just have to accept it and go with it. Um, so, um, but I think it's kind of really important for me, for my practice, it's really important to kind of challenge myself once, once in a while, just to be able to see if there's any, any other things that I'm missing or any other things I'm getting. Yeah, I like it. Um, I do. Um, 
especially like through this experience uh, having a conversation with um, the scientists within my group and through these residencies um, I found that there are a lot of similarities between the practice part and the practice science in a very different way um, that um, that um, we're looking for something we're always looking for something but not everything is always clear but there's always a uh, clue is it like a clue um, for example that better is a clue that it's it's something but um, maybe um, um, sometimes it may be a little bit it may be more poetic, not not to know exactly what I'm what I'm looking at, than like trying to find out and analyze it and doing um, making it concrete. That kind of yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 <laughs>